Good morning or good evening, wherever you might be tonight. And thank you for joining us. So I think all of you already know who I am. I'm Guy Three Joshi of Vorgate Impact. And we are known for providing sustainability assessments and helping organizations, particularly law firms, manage their sustainability journey. So we are the provider of the law firm ALICE assessment, which stands for the All Legal Industry Sustainability Standard. And so Borgie is pleased to co-host this, se this session with the um, Law Students for Climate Accountability. Um, so thank you, Haley. And it is a student-led organization that seeks to amplify the roles and responsibilities of the legal industry in the climate crisis. So, and it is famed for the law firm climate scorecard. And uh, the Law Students for Climate Accountability, they really aim to partner with law firms to work on solving this together. And so, um, as a matter of fact, uh, Haley, if you want to, um, there are some opportunities. We were talking about dropping a link in the chat at the beginning. If anyone wants to um, look at the form and connect with uh, LS4CA um, on building a legal legacy. So, which actually brings us to our topic. So, building a legal legacy. Now, communities and environments have been negatively impacted when far too many resources are drawn from the public good. So think clean air, water, and so forth. And today we'll be talking about the Chevron Richmond refinery. And you'll hear from one of our speakers, Alex, who I'm going to introduce in a little bit, about his experience as a future lawyer and resident of Richmond who experienced the detrimental harms of its refinery spill. So what do law firms have to do with this? Lawyers and law firms, they are the engineers whose designs have long lasting impacts in our societies and our communities. So, and that last for generations. So our interdependence is undeniable. And so our goal today is to connect those dots so we can understand in a very personal way how real people are affected and how generational harm is created and why we need to shift the paradigm. So we can build a proud legal legacy where we advise our clients, aligning with purpose, leaving minimal harm, or even better, potentially being restorative to the public good. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our speakers. So our first speaker is Ben McQuay, and he is the founder of McQuay & Co. Uh, ben McQuay is an industry leading transactional lawyer and an active leader in sustainable finance. So he is the founder of the Hong Kong Green Finance Association and is a Hong Kong representative and a member of the steering committee for the United Nations Financial Centers for Sustainability Network. And he has more than 20 years of legal experience with a focus on M&A, projects and financing. And we also have Erica Liu, and she is in her final year of law school at NYU Law. She grew up in Chengdu, China, and Vancouver, Canada. And prior to law school, Erica studied geography and political science with a focus on indigenous geographies and settler colonial studies at the University of Toronto. And she's interned with Earth Justice and the ACLU and is curious about the interconnections between law, power, and empire, and hopes to probe these connections in both her advocacy and research. And we also have Alex Lopez, and he's in his third year at UC Law SF, which is formerly UC Hastings. Alex lives in Richmond, California, with plans to become an environmental lawyer in the Bay Area. And he's interned with the Sierra Club's Environmental Law Program, the California Public Utilities Commission, and Communities for a Better Environment. So he wants to ensure frontline communities like Richmond obtain a healthy and safe environment. Um, so before we begin, um, just feel free to ask questions at any time, and we're going to do our best to answer as many as we can, and we'll make sure to save some time at the end uh, for some, some more questions. So, Alex, let's start with you first. Um, so, you're now a JD candidate. Did you always want to be in the environmental law space? Uh, yes, thank you very much for um, giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, so no, I and I came to law school formerly working for Catholic Charities here in San Francisco. I did legal assistant work for um, immigrants here in the Bay Area, and I wanted to pursue that career. Um, but once I started my first year here at law school, um, my torts professor was introducing nuisance claims, and he brought up Richmond and the Richmond refinery explosion in 2012. And it just caught my attention because um, I raised my hand and it was very 
moving to share with my classmates that I was actually here when that incident happened. Um, and just having that perspective and shift of interest was really important for my career in law school. Um, I wasn't exposed to environmental law before this. And so my professor sharing this experience and bringing this to light was, I think, a pivotal point where I started gaining more interest. And it was a call for my um, work in this, in this space. So I think I give a lot of thanks to the professor. So here's a question. So there are a lot of folks who really, who probably don't know about the Richmond refinery spill and explosion. So can you talk a little bit more about that pathway and what you actually experienced when all of that was happening? So people kind of understand from that, from your perspective of what it was like. Yeah, so Richmond is right next to Chevron's, one of Chevron's biggest refineries here in the West Coast. It's one of the oldest refineries here um, in the nation. But in 2012, there was one of the fire stacks was not well um, secured and they hadn't done correct investigation. Um, and there was a big boom that everyone heard here in the, in the area and just a huge pile of smoke just started coming up. Um, the fire alarms went off and I just remember like everyone telling us to stay in shelter. Um, it, happened, it, it happened for a couple of days, nothing was well reported. People started reporting that they had um, felt ill and people were hospitalized. And it just created a lot of chaos across the Bay Area. I know the news was constantly bringing it up, um, but I think being part of the community, it's something that we live with. Um, we know that we have a high chance of uh, getting respiratory infections and a lot of us live with asthma. And just having that type of power and balance between a refinery and the community, I think, is something that makes Richmond very unique in the area. Um, and I think there's a lot of information that folks don't have and having access to what type of resources might um, enable communities to be aware of their surroundings and their environment and how to protect themselves. I think that's something that we uh, don't really have in this area. And I think it's really crucial to bring that to a lot of spaces and especially in the legal community, um, what that entails for folks like Richmond, which are frontline communities. So there's definitely, of course, the health aspects um, that, were there other kinds of impacts that you'd seen? So whether they might be financial or otherwise in, in terms of the environment, um, were there other ways that the community was impacted? Well, I think just um, knowing the fact that the refinery is has a high percentage of Richmond's overall um, economic dependence, I think that's something that really impacts a lot of us because when we want to create a change for our community and our environment, I think we have, we have to take into account that a lot of the workforce comes from Richmond. And I think those types of issues make this type of environmental problem unique because you have to think about what about the labor force? What about folks who depend on the refinery to be there as well, but at the same time, we're combating something that's contaminating our, our space and where we live. Um, so I think that's really a shift and pull situation that's not unique to Richmond, but it's an example of where environmental justice um, complicates a lot of legal issues that will come up. So that actually kind of leads into a really interesting question. Um, considering you have, there's so much of the workforce that is there, um, but then plus you have the rest of the community. So are you able to speak to um, how, and maybe it'd be different for, from your perspective versus like others in the community, but how, aware were you of Chevron and its business practices as it pertains to that refinery? And was any of that information really accessible to the community or to the public? Yeah, no, I think um, it's not really accessible. I think it's just uh, something that looms in the back of residents um, in their mind and how they vote and how they participate um, in community advocacy, I think. There should be there can be more transparency. I think when elections come up, um, that's always a topic 
that has people that creates tension between people and the residents. Um, but I think in terms of the businesses, pra business practices that might be going on with Chevron, it's not something that folks are exposed to about, especially folks growing up um, in Richmond. I think um, you just are aware that there's a refinery there, but you're not really aware of how involved they are within the electoral process and also just creating a lot of economic support um, for the for the school district and for other type of infrastructure projects that might benefit the community. Um, so I think those types of resources um, are there, but it's not clear that there's a connection with this huge refinery. It makes it so complicated. Um, so, well, here's now another question. So what does it mean for you when, you know, you're talking about being on the front line for your community? And, um, does that look the same for everyone? Is it different? And how is it different? Like, what are the nuances of all of that? I think just the fact that we are a, a big community of migrants and um, low income. And I think being the first uh, generation of my family to go to college in general, and now being in law school, I think is a huge um, step forward, but it also carries a lot of weight because there's not a lot of folks that come from a frontline community like Richmond that are in law school that are exposed to all this information. And I think my purpose of being a public interest lawyer um, and pursuing that career, but also coming from a community and having this prior experience really makes being a lawyer more complicated and difficult because you carry a lot of more weight because um, living in the community I'm still aware of all the inequalities and um, problems that people are facing that are exacerbated by climate change and the fact that I'm in law school and an advocate of my community all the time. Um, my experience is unique, but I think that perspective is nuanced to what a traditional lawyer or traditional law student looks like, especially in an environmental law space. Um, so I think just growing up here, the fact that the situation hasn't really improved as much um, is something that motivates me while I'm in law school, but also brings awareness about what type of change um, I can contribute to. So, okay, so then uh, being in this space, what do you think a just transition could look like? Yeah, I think it's super complicated for um, folks in Richmond who are experiencing like climate change is affecting us on a daily basis. Like today we're having a heat wave um, and we still have the Richmond refinery nearby. I think um, as residents of California where we are the leading state with a lot of climate policy, climate change policies, I think it is important to remember that frontline communities like Richmond um, need to be part of this conversation and not be left out. Like historically, we've been left out in a lot of different policies. Um, I think for a just transition, imagining moving from fossil fuel dependency to something where we depend on wind or solar or other type of renewables, um, to not forget other issues that affect communities like Richmond, like I said earlier, a lot of our economy depends on Richmond Refinery, for example. And if we're forcing a transition into renewables, not to forget that environmental justice communities have way more problems that need to be accounted for in that process. So we're not left behind and to take the grunt of the brunt of all the problems that come with moving from a fossil fuel dependent uh, dependency um, system. So I just think it's important to have that perspective in mind when policies and, and laws are changed um, because we don't want to risk another situation where a bunch of EJ communities are left um, to suffer the consequence of just holistic uh, policies that don't take, take into account the nuances of frontline communities. So here, I'm going to ask you this last question. So from, again, your perspective, you know, how would you want to see concerns addressed within the community? On different levels, I think, and having conversations like this is a first step. I think also um, 
whenever there's an opportunity for folks from the community to be part of a conversation to make that possible. Um, I think the issue for folks like in Richmond, um, it's multi-layered. It's at the state level, it's local level, and it's internationally because um, Richmond is just an example, illustrative of many communities that um, are impacted. And I think um, as a lot of the focus nationally is to transition to some rene renewable energy, to remember that EJ communities are at the front line of a lot of the climate change problems and to keep those communities always um, involved in these processes and to think about how solutions might create possible problems and also to work ways to um, make alternatives for folks who are like in Richmond exposed to one of the oldest and most contaminating um, facilities in the country. Now, okay, I'm gonna ask you one last question. So how does that make you feel knowing that that had gone on for so long? Really, I won't say unchallenged, but nothing was really done um, in terms of the regulations or really kind of having them change their practices where there was some risk, right? And there was there were going to be liability issues. I think the fact that um, it took a long time to bring some of this information um, to the public, and I think the fact that a refinery explosion had to happen until change could be made, I think it's frustrating and it's also very, um, I think it enables more folks to speak up um, because it has to do with moving away from our comfort um, the way, uh, about the ways that the systems are working um, and trying to think about perspectives that are not our own um, and trying to put ourselves in shoes of folks who might be in vulnerable um, positions like folks in frontline communities. Um, and I think just trying to wrestle with that idea about if one, one solution seems viable um, to always think about different perspectives and to make sure that um, there's different alternatives that don't create more problems and complicate the situation that specific folks have to deal with. Um, and so by creating these alternatives, we don't exacerbate some of these challenges that folks have been dealing on for years. Um, and that way we can have more collaborative efforts to, to make change that's more applicable to folks across the spectrum. That's such a useful way to sort of color the story of why this is so important. Um, thank you, Alex. So Erica, I want to talk a little bit about cognitive dissonance. It's something that I've spoken a lot with Haley and some other folks, just this idea of cognitive dis dissonance. And, you know, it's where we, you know, separate ourselves from, um, it's something that's that's actually happening. You can kind of go more into it. Um, but we can see from Alex's story, just you know, the, the storytelling and exposing these lived consequences, it's 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 very powerful. Um, what I want you to do for us is if you can help connect the dots, you know, why you now obviously um this company was advised by a law firm um, as they were going through you know, different regulations and um, working through, um, you know, different things for their business practices and so forth. So using this as an example and just kind of creating something more conceptual, why should firms feel responsible for the work they do for a client? So not only in terms of the work product, but say morally as well. And where do you think this cognitive dissonance comes from? So it's a, it's a big meaty piece for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, sorry, my cat is freaking out because she really wants dinner. Um, so if she walks across the screen, that's what's going on. Um, I'm going to address the cognitive dissonance questions first. And I think there's primarily two reasons why I think there is cognitive dissonance. And I think these are reasons that are inherent to legal practice. One is that we think about actions in the legal industry as discrete cases or controversies. So you take on a case that's specific to one regulation. 
um, it could be years before you interact with the same client again on like a similar type of case. Whereas, whereas the impacts of each individual case are projected into the future. So you're engaging in an action where the consequences don't come immediately from what you've done. And also each individual action is separated into discrete cases, um, as opposed to thinking about one specific place where cases accumulate and harms accumulate. So I think that that kind of categorizing of the work that lawyers do is contributes to the cognitive distance. And then also the actual subject matter of these cases themselves. I think sometimes it's hard to reconcile the idea of, well, I'm really just litigating this one regulation. That's a very technical issue. It's hard to understand how that has an impact. But I think Alice's story is a great example where a refinery, uh, a refinery fire or an explosion doesn't just randomly or suddenly happen. It happens due to years of like deregulation and um, just like slight changes in the, the, the regulatory landscape has essentially failed. And litigation against regulatory measures or to weaken regulatory measures or even to weaken forms of judicial review that contribute to how those regulations are then reviewed in court, like all of those procedural mechanisms have an impact on the actual substance of the law, which then accumulate and translate to impacts such as a fire or explosion. So I think those are just two structural things about legal practice that contribute to this dissonance. And then in terms of why should lawyers feel like there is a moral responsibility, um, I think I think there are many philosophical reasons you can get into about this, but I think the one reason that really stands out to me is that as lawyers, we essentially have a, well, I'm not a lawyer yet, as a future lawyer and as the lawyers in this room, we have essentially a monopoly over access to justice and also legal expertise. People defer to our judgment, our voices carry sway. A lot of people go to law school, uh, not necessarily because they want to practice as a lawyer, but because having a law degree gives them some sort of institutional um power some sort of legitimacy in conversations where their ideas are heard and people are interested in what they have to say. So I think with that kind of expertise and powers comes a responsibility to exercise that um, in moral ways or at least in considered ways. And, you know, I'm thinking about this because I'm actually in professional responsibility right now. <laughs> Even within the rules and ethics of professional responsibility, there it's not like they're devoid of moral responsibility. In fact, there are specific ways in which lawyers can opt out of representing particular clients or particular cases because there is a moral repugnance. So part of it is too that maybe perhaps people don't see climate change as the level of moral repugnance in which they feel like they would need to step out. And I think that contributes to a much broader problem of cognitive distance with climate change as well, where, um, the harms are distributed unequally, the harms oftentimes are invisible in the short term. That's my very long winded answer, but I think a lot of the problems with cognitive distance and also with the lack of more responsibility are just built into the structures of legal practice itself. So what would you say to someone if they said, well, you know, I really feel like I should only concern myself with the work that I've been given, that I've been given from my partner or that we've gotten from client and I should just only carry that out. Like, what would you say to someone? I think, I think that speaks to a much broader problem of where we're trying to individualize kind of our own moral culpability. I think it's a it's the same kind of rhetoric that you know, Exxon or um, these firms, I mean not firms, these um, energy companies employ, which is well, you contribute to climate change we all contribute to climate change. So why should I individually be held accountable for my contribution? Um, and again, I think it gets to this idea that lawyers, yes, we're individual lawyers, but we're also part of a broader professional group or like a guild in a way. Um, we're not necessarily conceived of the same way as like private business people. We are part of like a broader profession. So I think there is this sort of like collective sense of responsibility where your individual work is not just your individual work, you're operating in the, within a broader legal system. And the same way that you conceptualize yourself as part of the legal system, your consequence, the consequences of your actions should also be seen in that relational way. Um, yeah. Okay, so, you know, a lot of law firms, um, they think that 
their contributions through pro bono is their way to give back. So why is that not enough? I think there's just a level of incommensurability there with pro bono work and with um, a lot of the fossil fuel work. And actually this speaks to, so previously in our scorecard under our methodology, we allowed this sort of um, balancing out or if you engage in energy work, we allow that to kind of cancel out your fossil fuel work. So you get like a net score. Um, and then we as a group decided that we no longer wanted to adopt that methodology because on the ground, those consequences don't cancel out. When you engage, um, when you support a fossil fuel company in, for example, like deregulating a particular power plant or weakening the regulations that govern it, um, the consequences of that, such as the fire, don't get canceled out by you then working on a separate case on, um, on renewable energy. So we wanted to make sure that our methodology reflected the actual impacts of the work and not just kind of the upstream um, conceptualization of it. And also I think a lot of pro bono work, um, I think there's, I think sometimes pro bono ends up choosing, well, I'm gonna support this social justice issue. I'm gonna support, you know, anti-discrimination and that's a pro bono work I do. Um, but then you're still working on fossil fuel cases. And I think that just speaks to a broader problem about how the legal industry has siloed these discrete issues because the same issues that we have with frontline communities um, and the environmental justice harms that they go through is deeply connected with issues such as racial justice. Um, so I think in pro bono work, there's also this sort of trying to balance and say, well, I did this good social justice thing, so I should get leeway to do this bad thing. Um, and just the harms don't cancel out that way. So we don't, so I don't see the work itself um, helping to net out in that sense either. Do you think it would be helpful if, um, if firms really started to take into account and look at that in a very real way? Like, okay, you know, we worked on this particular matter and these are potentially the intended consequences versus, okay, we've done this pro bono and find where we're going to promote some kind of, some form of social justice with this particular like nonprofit. Um, do you, do you think something like that would be valuable? I think there are definitely ways of incorporating these considerations um, into firm operations and obviously there are there are rules about you know we understand that once you take on a client you can't just say well i'm going to work on this case with you but i'm not going to take this other case um if you've already kind of taken them on as a client so i think there are considerations in the sense that as the lawyer for a client you are in a position of like somewhat equal power where the things that you say to your client hold sway in a way that someone advocating on the outside might not so if you're talking to a firm and advising them i think there is there are opportunities there to bring in considerations uh, or to have them think a bit more about the consequences of what they're trying to do um, on communities, but also in core, in more of like a long-term and cumulative way. Yeah. Um, and then obviously there's also just kind of the more upstream where when you're choosing to take on a client, um, the kind of questions that you're asking yourself about what kind of values or what kind of legacy you're building for the firm long-term by having this client. Um, uh, I think there are different ways of bringing in those considerations. All right, so then I'll ask you this. So what role do you think law firms should play in the global marketplace? Um, you know, what's the biggest impact law firms can have on minimizing harm or restoring the public good as the advice clients? I think similar to what I said in response to the previous question, obviously mm -hmm. the the biggest impact would be to just not engage with this firm at all because the law firms are an integral part of the legal infrastructure that supports fossil fuel companies. So to just cut off that kind of, re that relationship would have a significant impact on um, the viability of the fossil fuel industry. Um, but I think beyond that kind of uh, action, I think the things that I mentioned about, you know, a community, a community may not be able to advocate in front of a client 
um, the way that the law firm or lawyers can, or at least the things that they say might not hold the same sway. So I think there are opportunities for those ideas, or at least those interests or those considerations to be brought up in conversation uh, and represented in some sense in conversations with clients, or at least clients who are at least amenable to thinking about these issues. Um, so I think that's like one kind of short term way of trying to just be more mindful of these issues and having it have an actual effect on decision making. That's a bit short of just wholesale kind of dropping a client or just not taking on a client at all. Well, um, that is that actually is a perfect segue um, for us to talk to Ben about what he has done at his firm. So uh, thank you, Erica. Uh, so Ben, um, I think your story is so interesting. Can you give us an overview of how you started the firm and um, and, you know, where you came from, where you started, and just your your journey. So just tell everyone about your journey. Um, thanks, Gayatri, very much. And uh, and uh, to uh, LSCA for inviting me to, to share the microphone with Erica, Alex, and, uh, and, and Haley. So um, where to start? I think um, probably uh, let me just reflect very slightly on... Uh, on uh, some of Alex's comments, because I think that's quite an interesting or sort of segue into uh, into my sort of uh, uh, professional journey, or at least the most recent part of it. Um, you, you, you know, I, 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 as Gayatri, I think I'm not sure fairly or unfairly remarked in your uh, intro that, uh, you know, I've been a lawyer for a long time, well over 20 years now, it makes me feel very old in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, sharing. Um, you know, and, and for much of my career, you know, I, I just raced around the, uh, the, you know, the world and so I'm based in Asia and certainly this part of the world, just chasing after the biggest deals and the most interesting deals I could get my hands on in a, I'm going to say, typically non-discerning way. In fact, you know, for quite a few of those years, I was uh, an energy lawyer focusing on the oil and gas sector. Um, um, and so, you know, so, some, some years ago, um, it was really in the context of, Sort of figuring out the transition, the, the 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 natural transition of an energy practice in a big international law firm, um, that I that I sort of stumbled, I suppose, across sort of sustainability, and and then it was in the form of sustainable finance, and that sort of took me on a bit of a journey, um, to the extent that I decided that I needed to figure out a way to really combine the sort of practice of law with my sort of newer found uh, sort of uh, interest and, and passion in um, uh, sustainability. I mean, that, that's how I sort of define my interest. Um, and, and it really wasn't very easy. And so whilst sort of Alex was talking about, you know, at the very beginning of his career, he's already empowered to, 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 sort, of, to sort of shape his career around the sort of the values and the very strong sense of uh, commitment that he has. To his community, um, I'm I'm much more of a latecomer to, uh, to to that sense of empowerment. Um, but because I'd been practicing for a long time and been in business for a long time, you know, I, I was able to perhaps do something, you know, a bit different and in in, in a way a bit more tangible. So I set up a um, uh, um, a law firm uh, that bears my name. Um, we, we, we only take on mandates that are aligned with the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 Global Goals. Um, um, and, and we, as a consequence, you know, just have, have really placed, I suppose, our values, which is in the form of a sustainability at the heart of our business plan. And so we're different um, as a law firm because, you know, when, when, when sort of clients come to us, then you know the first question we ask ourselves is well is the prospective mandate or the outcome of the prospective mandate aligned with the uh, sustainable development goals and if the answer to that first question is is yes then we ask ourselves well do we have between us the uh, the skill sets to to do the work and if the answer to that question is yes as well then uh, then, then we take on the, uh, the 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 mandate so we 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 operate 
at what I would describe as this sort of intersection of, of law and uh, sustainability. And because um, almost necessarily that, that sort of brings us into the sort of field of innovation as well. Um, and, and that's like that's where we like to uh, to, to, to place ourselves. Um, Gayatri, shall I just stop there because I, I could go on, but maybe you've got other questions. Um, no, well, so, you know, there were some more things that I wanted to talk about in terms of how you thought about reputation and thought about creating your purpose, how just going through that process, because, you know, there are, there are a number of firms that um, would like to consider and bring forth to, to their firms and their committees. Well, how can we start to make this shift? Mm. What are things that you might be able to share from how you started in that thought process with, cre again, creating sort of that purpose that you wanted to have and how it seemed to make sense from, you know, a business standpoint, mm. as well as just the, the legacy that you wanted to leave behind. Sure, thank you. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, it's it's really important to have a, a business case. Um, you know, we, we, we can be sort of individually sort of motivated, you know, to, to support, you know, a cause or a, whatever it is that sort of, you know, gets our sort of, you know, pulses racing. But, you know, in, in, in the legal profession, then ultimately, you know, we need to be profitable. And, and, and we can choose, of course, how profitable um, or you know, what levels of profitability are enough for us. But nevertheless, we have to be profitable because we have to hire people, we have to bring in the next generation of lawyers, we have to train people, and we have to do all of the, uh, we have all of the sort of expense and overhead that, uh, that uh, legal businesses um, uh, uh, have. So um, my, my feeling was that, or my sort of um, epiphany, I suppose, was 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 really on the back of um, sort of the climate change. Um, um, I suppose the realization, you know, back in uh, Paris in uh, 2015, that that you know, amongst the global leaders, that that climate change is real, and that we need to do something about it. Now, you know, I think people can disagree that how fast the clock is ticking and how long we've got and what what, what the impact and long term implications are. But I think most most people now accept that. You know, a a form of climate or climate change to a degree is a is a is a real issue and something that needs to be uh, tackled. And you know, the the world leaders, you know, starting in Paris, you know, sort of accepted responsibility to to decarbonize. I, I forget now, but it's a very high percentage of, uh, of of the countries and territories globally are under some form of uh, de decarbonization commitment now. And, and, and that means we've got to raise trillions and trillions of dollars annually for the next 20, 30 years um, um, in order to have a fighting chance of, 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 of tackling climate change, which means by, by sort of extension that in most cases that the public sector, public funds won't, won't come close to, uh, to being able to pay for this cost. So we have to mobilize private money. We have to mobilize private capital. And in order to do that, then private sector needs to be able to make money and to, and to me the sort of the first epiphany was this idea that you know the only way to tackle climate change is to come up with you know interesting solutions and ideas and financial uh, packages and all sorts of uh, clever things um, 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 that have to be profitable and so I felt that you know there has to be a business case around this and sustainability broadly has to be a, a growth area so I felt pretty confident because I was in a fairly unique position at that time, and probably still am, as a sort of as a sort of full time private practice uh, um, commercial lawyer, um, who, who also has a sort of window into sort of policy and international best practices, both regionally and um, sort of supranationally through UN. So I thought, well, I can just pull all of that together. Um, in 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 a business, and actually my business is a, a bit broader than a, a law firm. We we do legal and regulatory, we do strategy and in, and innovation, um, as sort of one offering. But the legal and regulatory support that we give our clients is, of course, the regulated bit, and so we need to deliver that through a law firm, um, you know, strictly in accordance with the uh, the rules of the law society that uh, that, that govern our uh, our uh, industry in this part of the world. Um, um, and so the question. 
that became sort of, I suppose, central to my ability to really sort of shape the business that I wanted and in a way that I, I felt I could launch and I felt I could articulate and sort of sell to the market and sell to clients was, you know, what do we stand for? Um, you know, what, 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 what's our value proposition? What's our mission statement? However you want to call it, you know, what, what, what do we stand for as a firm? And it was quite an interesting sort of thought process because, you know, I'd worked with some of the, uh, the very largest US and, and uh, British law firms. And, and, and every firm has a sort of statement somewhere on their website about, you know, who, who we are. But, but it doesn't really tell you very much about, you know, the sort of the values of the firm and, and, and what the firm um, um, actually stands for. Um, and there's all sorts of good reasons for that, which, you know, some of which would be, you know, patently obvious. Um, so, so for, for my business, I felt that, um, you know, we should start with the, the, the values and, and build out from there. And I thought along with my team, you know, what, what's the right, I suppose, hook, what's the right anchor for us? And, and after a bit of sort of research and discussion, um, I decided that uh, the sustainable development goals were the, were the best anchor because they're relatively well known. They're very broad, of course. And, and the SDGs have been sort of, uh, the SDGs are, um, I suppose, the, the subject, every, every, excuse me, I'm hesitating slightly because I'm not quite, I can't quite remember the stats, but because the SDGs de derive from sort of UN commitments, then, you know, most, most countries have some sort of level of, at some level, have committed to uh, integrate SDGs within their own um, um, within their own sort of uh, um, financial and uh, business ecosystem. So it, it's it's it seemed a relevant a a sort of relatively well understood um, and certainly broad uh, anchor. So so that's what we did. So we only take on work that's aligned, as I've mentioned. We we have developed a uh, methodology um, that we apply, and that that was another process. Um, because of course SDGs are really designed for policy integration, not 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 really for law firms to to discern whether or not they're willing to take on a a, a client or a particular mandate. But ultimately, for us, it comes down to choice. And and I, I don't know the rules in the uh, for the bar councils or law societies in 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 all of your jurisdictions. But you know, in in mine, and actually, not many people uh, understand or realise this. But in my jurisdiction, you know, law firms. Are, are allowed to choose the the work that they that they take on or the clients they take on. They're not allowed to discriminate um, for obvious reasons. But uh, if if but if we want to choose not to take on a client or not to take on a particular mandate because it doesn't align with our values and our values proposition is sort of sustainability related or climate related or whatever it may be, then uh, then that's purely a matter of choice. And what we've really done is just elected to to choose. Um, um, and it's quite remarkable, at least I think it's quite remarkable, how few uh, you know, lawyers that I know and the firms that they represent um, um, are even aware that they have the ability to choose. And what I say is, well, we choose every day based on conflicts, legal or commercial, based on sort of fee, um, anticipated fee revenue is a matter, is it worth getting out of bed for? So we, we choose every day as lawyers and law firms what work we take on. And in my firm, we also choose based on the uh, the alignment or non-alignment of a, uh, a mandate relative to our, our, our values. Dietary. So I, I love how you have modeled the client matter intake process. Um, you know, it'd be great if we could talk through a little bit of a practical example. So, you know, so say if you're advising on a contract, which can be very one-sided, um, how do you determine a standing point? Um, you could use a refinery as an example or something else as an example, but say something where maybe you don't initially start with that alignment. Like, walk us through how you would go through that process. Yeah, so actually, very soon after... Uh... My, uh, my my firm went uh, went live um, sort of two and a half years ago. I was faced with a, uh, I suppose it's a dilemma. And anyone who, uh, who who does or is thinking of setting up a business or setting up a law firm, you know, will know that we 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 anticipate as much as we can. But uh, well, there there are plenty of surprises uh, that that we just don't anticipate. And so, I my sort of mission statement, if you like, was that we would only take on SDG aligned work. And uh, within days, certainly within the first week or two, we had uh, 
a, a an inquiry from a client, um, you know, could we advise on X, where X was, I'm going to say neutral, it wasn't negative, it wasn't positive, sort of hand on heart, it wasn't positive, it was just neutral, it was, you know, drafting, um, you know, commercial agreements and contracts and supplier agreements and things. And so, so my dilemma what, what 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 do we do? Do we say, well, okay, neutral's fine. Hey, we're a new business. We've all got to transition. Or, or do I sort of hold firm and say, no, 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 we will only take on work that is positively aligned, i.e. we will only do work that, that, that we think, you know, delivers some sort of, um, you know, uh, um, uh, benefit. So uh, everyone advised me the former. I chose the latter. And so actually, so I went back to the, the then prospective client and said, well, look, you know, we can do the legal work, but as you know, I've made this commitment and, you know, fairly or rightly or wrongly, um, I, I need to be very uh, careful. I need to be very sort of faithful, as it were, to this commitment that I've made. Um, what do you want to do? And my expectation was that, you know, that, that the prospective client would just run a mile and go and find a, another law firm that was less complicated. Um, but actually, the response was quite a surprise. The response was, what do you mean we're not aligned? And I would never say to a client, hey, you're bad for the environment or you're, you know, you're bad for this, that and the other, but you're, 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 you're not aligned. So actually the, 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 the um, then prospective client, um, their response was, well, you know, we, we really want to get behind sort of sustainability values. It's actually very important to our business and we want, you know, our supply chain and etc cetera, etc cetera. you know can you help us you know find alignment and that was actually quite a light bulb uh, moment for uh for, for my firm um so of course the response was yes we can um and so we helped them perhaps as the first step of the project um we helped them just reframe their i suppose the out the outcome um in a way that was aligned with SDGs, um, um, mainly on the climate side. Um, and, and actually, everyone was, I think, very happy with the outcome. And I, I think to the extent that the, the client, you know, re remembers the, so the service that we provide, or that we provided, it's probably going to be that part of the service, because I think that's a real value add I mean, the legal work's the legal work, and in most cases, there's plenty of firms that can do the legal work, you know, in any market, just as uh, just as competently as uh, as we all can. Um, so it's like a value add to our um, um, service, and that that's come up, you know, a few times. And the the light bulb, I suppose, uh, sort of moment or the the key takeaway, again, it comes back to the point of choice that I made, is that you know we 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 lawyers, you know, we don't realize this necessarily. That you know we have this very unique position, you know this sort of courtside seat on every major commercial transaction, you know every dispute and and every policy decision, and so the list goes on. And so if if we want to help deliver or help clients deliver a more positive outcome, and that's positive outcome measured against you know something tangible, whether it's climate or other sustainability or ESG values, then then we can and we can do that through our engagement letter. Um, we can write into our engagement letters that, you know, we, we will deliver, yes, there's the legal work, but we will also um, help deliver a, 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 a more positive outcome. And, and, and that's what we do. You know, there have been other cases or examples that have come to us. There, have been, there, there was actually a refinery case, partly because my history in oil and gas, there was a potential uh, refinery related uh, matter. Um, I, I just told the, uh, it was the, uh, fund looking to invest in a uh, in a project and i just had to say we, we just can't do it we wouldn't we wouldn't do it um um so in that case you know one, one has to just say no which is very counterintuitive to uh, a lot of uh, professionals and definitely legal professionals to turn down work and turn away work that you're perfectly uh, competent and equipped to uh to, to to do but um you know when when we perhaps it's just perhaps a final point Actually, before I pass the microphone back to you, you know, when, when we made sort of relatively bold sort of value commitments as businesses, and I think most definitely as law firm uh, businesses, you know, we, we in a way put a target on our back because 
if we say we will only take on, you know, S in our case, SDG aligned mandates, we have to make very, very sure that we that's that we kind of we practice what we preach and that we only do that. And it's not enough that we know that we're sort of faithful to our uh, commitments. We have to be able to, we have to be fully transparent. We have to report that. And actually we do that in our uh, annual report. Our second annual report is in, uh, will, will soon be published. Um, but it's really an impact report where we go through, of course, we can't disclose um, all the client information, but we, we, we disclose the, the sort of outcomes of our assessment of the client mandates against our SDG tracker, as well as our performance against some of our own um, um, sort of uh, sustainability commitments, in, including our uh, decarbonization strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can actually, we'll, we'll share that uh, um, that report with everyone. Um, Cause I, I actually took a look at that and I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty impressive. You know, Erica, I wanna make sure that we talk about the Legacies Project. Um, so can you, can you share more about that? Yeah, the, perp um, the Legacies Project is, um, it's essentially a blog where we're hoping to highlight stories that emphasize the connections that we've talked a bit about today between individual actions um, where firms are representing fossil fuel clients, connecting those individual actions across time, focusing on particular space, um, and then, then connecting that to the consequences of those actions. So to kind of push back against some of the cognitive dissonance that I was talking about earlier to show kind of like the lineage of work that happens in particular places that concentrate in particular places as opposed to others. Um, and then also to really highlight the organizing, particularly the community organizing and community activism that also builds up around these legacies as well. Um, and the idea is, the purpose of it is really to get at the problem that we've talked about today, where there's just a disconnect between what lawyers think about, how they think about their own work um, in terms of the broader impacts on climate and also particularly on communities. So we really want to shed a particular light on those connections. And um, we have a post up right now and it's linked through our website that kind of talks more in detail about the specific framing of the project, some of its uh, purposes, which are um, include the ones that I mentioned today. Um, and our first post is particularly, particularly about North Richmond and the Chevron refinery and kind of the legacy of um, firm work that has happened there as well as the community response. Um, thank you, Erica. Um, I want to ask each of you, I want, I'm posing this question to each of you. So, and Ben, thank you so much for before. I think um, just having some of the firms understand how you have shifted will give them the ability to start having those conversations on how they might as well. Um, but the question I'd pose to each of you to share is, you know, what should law firms think about when they are advising clients on matters? So you might have spoken about that before, but if you can very succinctly just to give some um, really good advice that you want to leave behind on how they can give the best, most robust advice to clients while still considering communities and the environment, um, I think that would be very, very insightful. Did you, who do you want to go first? <laughs> Um, well, Ben, since uh, you volunteered to speak up just now, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I actually, I, I'm I'm still sort of deliberating your your question a little bit because there's 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 a lot in that. Um, I I think of course, and without wishing to sound too much like a lawyer about it, you know, there there are sort of duties and fiduciary duties that we always have to consider whenever we take on uh, client mandates, and you know, the, these are. Uh, these are uh, strict and, and and very important. Um, I, I I actually think you know before we get into the how to advise, you know we have to think you know what what clients do we do we do we want to take on and what 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 work do we want to take on, and so I think perhaps the starting point and I might be uh, not really answering your question, but I think the sort of the starting point you know for for a lot of firms and 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 lawyers is to is to you know look look at firm values and if you don't see that there's any sort of values alignment or if you feel like you know the value statements aren't necessarily um 
aren't necessarily the kind of the north star that uh, that the lawyers follow then you, you, you need to engage in an internal conversation you know and, and speak to colleagues and speak to uh, you know department practice leaders and speak to uh, speak to uh, management or wh whoever's whoever will listen and and just have a conversation around it because in all law firms the same as any other business you know there's a sort of an internal angle and there's an external angle and internally it's you know to what extent are, are, are we sort of committing or should we be committing to managing our own business in accordance with you know sustainability and you know, linked um, 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 uh, uh, values and principles and and then from the external perspective is you know to what extent is all this stuff and it is confusing and it's ESG and it's sustainability and it's climate all these sort of interconnecting and you know it, it, this is sort of you know jargon soup we live in these days you know to what extent do we is this going to be important to our business plan going forward and how do we integrate that and and you know oft, often you're pushing against closed doors internally because you know we, we don't always like change in uh, law firms so starting point I think is really to have a conversation and then when you figure out what it all means and how you want to uh, how you want to serve clients in respect of these environmental and social related issues and values, I think then you get on to, okay, well, what, what, what does that mean within the context of an actual mandate and the sort of advice that we give? And as a final uh, comment, and I, I realize I'm, uh, as always, taking up too much time, um, you know, speak to the bar councils and the law societies, you know, they, they, they should be, and they're certainly in a position to provide guidance to their member law firms about, you know, best practices. You know, I don't know of any others. I mean, I'm not advocating for them, but the Law Society of England and Wales have loads of uh, really useful information for their uh, member law firms about what to consider. And it's very much climate focused, but how how, how how to interpret this stuff, what to consider when, when advising clients and taking on uh, mandates and also as they manage their own business. So speak to law societies, because I think, um, you know, unless and until there's a bit of a steer from a regulatory authority, then you know it it, it it's hard for the you know for the the firms and the industry um, to uh, to 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 sort of develop their own sort of cohesive, um, coherent and um, uh, approach. I'll stop. <laughs> um, well, just in terms of other resources, you know, we've we've talked about obviously there's the ADA, which is you know the law society here in the U United States, but the Chancery Lane Project. Um, so they they have just incredible resources on just things that you can include um, and contracts and agreements and just all sorts of wonderful clauses. So that's that's something. Uh, I remember you mentioning that last time. Um, so thank you, Ben. Um, Erica or Alex, what would you share? Um, I kind of second what Ben said, like, look into um, specific societies love or bar associations and your local local jurisdictions or states. I think there's a lot of conversations happening between government um, lawyers and private lawyers and even some public interest lawyers about ways to create innovation. And I think every jurisdiction is different. Like California looks different than Texas or Florida. Um, and having an open mindset about ways to reach certain climate goals or prevent future harm or further harming communities um, that are frontline communities. I think also preventing to get to the litigation stage, like we have the possibility to make change within negotiations um, and alternative solutions. And I think if firms can have more opportunities for creating that, to change through that, that way, I think we could have more benefits for I think the industry itself and also um, for the public, but I think it demands a little bit of introspection and also um, being open-minded to change. Thank you, Alex. What about you, Erica? Um, yeah, I will second everything that's been said. Um, I, I guess the, I'll emphasize what Ben was saying about how important it is to come together as a group and think about what are the guiding values of the firms and just to have some sort of consensus or discussion on what those might be. Because um, a lot of times from what I understand of my friends who are at firms, um, there are, um, sometimes there just aren't rooms for those, uh, space for that conversation. 
And then also, I think in terms of one particular consideration, it's helpful to think when taking on a client, and again, I know firms all have their own individual processes for how to do this, um, but to think a bit more long-term about what are the consequences of taking on a particular client, because um, the particular consequences of taking on a fossil fuel client now may feel very different from the consequences in 10 years or 20 years. So I think having a broader scope of what it means to take on a client is also helpful. Thank you, Erica. So Haley, um, I would, I know you've been posting in that chat um, about the form, but can you just highlight about the, the opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. So we're always really excited to engage with law firms. And I think firms don't always realize that. And so we're trying to take this opportunity as, as we work with you, Gayatri, to make sure that firms know that we want to be partners in figuring out how to move the legal industry toward a just transition. Um, and so part of that means having the conversations. And so we're excited that that folks showed up tonight. Um, and I've also put in the chat, if you're interested in having a firm specific conversation, I'd say one-on-one, -on -one, but probably we'd bring a couple folks and you'd be welcome to bring a couple folks. Um, but if you're interested in having a conversation specifically about, about your firm, um, whether that's you know, you want to know about our scorecard methodology and how we came up with the grade, or you want to know about our pledge and why we came up with it or implementing climate commitments. We're, we're very, very happy to talk through things and we certainly aren't going to have all of the answers, but um, we're fortunate to know uh, a lot of folks that are working on, on these kinds of things like Ben, uh, who I know has made uh, his methodology available to folks um, and, and many other folks who have helped us with our reports. So um, we're, we're eager to share knowledge and figure out what we can do to to move this industry forward. And that means, you know, we're very excited for the folks that are here and hopefully uh, additional folks will see this later and we'll sign up. It sounds excellent. So um, I think if there's uh, no other questions, no other comments, I think we will wrap this up. Um, Alex, Erica, and Ben, thank you so much for speaking on this topic and really kind of showing some practical examples and connecting the dots. Um, and Haley, thank you so much for, uh, you know, co-hosting this. So um, I hope everyone found this useful. All thank right. You. Well, everyone either have a good rest of your day or have a great night.